Welcome to Plant-Based Kidney Health. I'm Michelle Krosmer, renal dietitian here with Dr. Hashmi, nephrologist, and we have a great topic today. We are talking about sugar and kidney health and kidney disease. And so before we dive in, um, just briefly, so we all are on the same page before we go into sugar, added sugar, sugar from fruit, um, really what is sugar? So sugar is, you know, we have mono and disaccharides. When we think of the monosaccharides, um, you know, we're, and then disaccharides are going to be two monosaccharides put together. Ultimately, the main thing to know is that um, we have fructose, glucose, and galactose are our monosaccharides. And then disaccharides, there's different examples of them. Lactose, which we know is in milk, um, animal milk, human milk is going to be two monosaccharides. So it's galactose and glucose. Or if we think of sucrose, which is table sugar, then we that's made up of fructose and glucose. Why does that even ma matter? Um, really, the main thing is, is that it's sugar, right? But when we think of sugar that is found naturally in food, like fruit and milk, for example, um, it's coming along with vitamins and um, other vitamins, minerals, fiber, nutrients, other things that our body benefits from and needs. When sugar is in an added form, it's really just that sugar and it doesn't come along with those other benefits and might even have some potentially harmful effects. And so just an example of that, if you think of a strawberry, you know, a strawberry is mostly going to be you know, fructose and glucose. Um, table sugar is also fructose and glucose. But if we compare table sugar to a strawberry, that strawberry has vitamin C, it has fiber, it has antioxidants. So there's a much bigger benefit of eating a strawberry than there is eating table sugar, even though they both technically have the same monosaccharides in them. So um, I think that's plenty on that. We just know there's a difference between added sugar and the sugar that's naturally found in food. But how, Dr. Hashmi, I mean, how does sugar even impact kidneys and kidney health and kidney disease progression? Yeah, so this is a really fascinating question because a lot of folks think that, you know, sugar is really not that harmful. But it turns out that when we talk about correlation versus causation, correlation is the idea that, you know, I step out today and there's lightning. So if I said it was causation, it's because I stepped out of my house. And that's why lightning struck. If it's correlation, it just means two events occur together and they might have something to do with it, but one is not causing the other. So it just so happened that I stepped out and the lightning happened at the same time, the events were correlated. So when we talk about sugar, sugar actually has a causal role when it comes to kidney disease. And the underlying thought process is several things. For example, we know that the more sugar you eat, the higher your uric acid levels are going to go. Now, uric acid has gone through a lot of controversial phases because there was a lot of discussion that uric acid would damage the kidneys, but that lowering uric acid with medications did not change the outcomes. So hence, people were like, ah, well, forget about looking at uric acid. And I actually disagree with the majority of the nephrologists out there. I actually measure uric acid on my patients because it helps me to guide them on if they're eating well or if they're eating poorly. And it's a great marker for me to tell. So uric acid is one. Of course, sugar is linked to diabetes. And there's a lot of thought process on how that occurs. But in some cases, it's because people's diets, when they're eating sugar, they're eating sugar, salt, and fat, because those are the three things that really light up all your brain receptors. All the dopamine in your brain really kicks in when you start to combine sugar, salt, and fat together. And so what happens is the fat goes inside cells and creates insulin resistance, and you keep putting sugar, which is like gasoline on a fire. So the idea of diabetes is your body can't get rid of that sugar. And when it can't dispose of the sugar, it starts to do damage, including kidney damage. So diabetes is another one. The third one is, is obesity. Obesity is this concept where what we're essentially doing is we're putting more calories in our body than our body is able to use. As a result of it, our body says, that's fine. I'm going to save it in case I have to do something later on. Most of the time, there really isn't anything you have to do later on. So because of all of those things, we end up looking at this concept of sugar is tight. Now, fructose 
which when we talk about sweeteners and et cetera going on, fructose is the main component that ends up leading to this elevations in uric acid. And something else that ends up becoming very interesting is, is that as you start to increase uric acid, so you eat more sugar, you increase uric acid, you start to release more renin. And renin, if you remember, is part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. This is the main pathway for regulating blood pressure and it comes to the kidneys. So what happens is the more renin you end up secreting, the more you start to cause fibrosis inside the body. So one more time, more sugar leads to more uric acid, also leads to more renin, which then leads to fibrosis inside the kidney and fibrosis in the rest of the body as well. So the bottom line here is, is when we talk about sugar, there is causality on how it can go ahead and damage the kidneys. So Michelle, with that, you know, what about the sugar that's found in fruit? Do people need to worry about that when it comes to chronic kidney disease? So in general, no. I mean, how I, as I mentioned before, there's a big difference in the sugar that's found in, you know, strawberry or an apple and the sugar that's found in syrup or um, table sugar or anything like that because of the other things along with it. And fiber is one of those big things. So when we think of a strawberry, strawberries are actually a lower sugar, higher fiber fruit. But what happens is our body's breaking down sugar and then it's using it for um, energy and for fuel but it raises our blood sugar. And so of course, the, what we normally think about is in uh, diabetes, right? And we're like, okay, well, we want to be limiting the refined sugars and we want to get more fiber because that fiber is going to slow down how quickly um, that sugar is broken down and our blood sugar raises. And I'm sure there's people watching this who are like, well, I, you know, I have diabetes and I can't even you know, if I eat a piece of fruit, my blood sugar goes sky high. And I think that's where it's a lot more complicated for people with diabetes and in that with insulin resistance, because I've, I've worked with clients who couldn't eat. They're very insulin resistant. They couldn't eat fruit without their blood sugar spiking. But as they worked on their diet as a whole and getting more fiber, more less processed food, more exercise, all these other things, they're able to then start to tolerate fruit a little bit more. So I think from the standpoint of no, I mean, it's not equal. You know, it's not that if you have to cut out fruit, like we want you to be limiting added sugar. But if someone has diabetes, which, you know, half the people with kidney disease do, then you might need to be mindful of how much fruit you're eating in one serving and what else you're eating it with. Um, but it is not the same thing. And again, as I said before, we are getting vitamins, minerals, fiber, antioxidants, other beneficial things for the kidneys from fruit. And one of those big things too, is that they are more um, alkali producing and they help with preventing metabolic acidosis. And so it's, it's hard when we think we're like, oh, fruit has sugar, sugar is bad. I can't eat fruit because we have to think of what are all these other benefits for the kidneys and kidney health. Um, and then I think the other thing to keep in mind is if there, you are seeing spikes in blood sugar, I mean, eat more vegetables than fruit. A lot of times we, you know, fruit sweeter, we eat more of that, but non-starchy vegetables, you know, you can include fruit, but have a lot more of those non-starchy veggies and then blood sugar um, is not as much of an issue there. So with, I'm sure we'll get asked this, so let's address it. What about then artificial sweeteners? Yeah, so artificial sweeteners is an interesting term because it's actually not the correct term to use. And the reason for that is, is the proper term, which nobody uses out there, is called non-nutritive sweeteners. Non-nutritive sweeteners is a much better term because some of the sweeteners that we talk about, for example, people will talk about, uh, and I get bugged on this, I and mean, this is one of my biggest pet peeves, is they're like, but what about stevia? Uh, stevia is so awesome or monk fruit is so awesome and why can't I use that? You know, are you like anti-all? Yes, I am anti-all. And here's why. So when you start to look at the sweetness of sugar and you compare to the non-nutritive sweeteners, what you find is that the non-nutritive sweeteners are anywhere between 200 to as much as 26,000 times sweeter than sugar. So now let's just start with the basics. Let's say you're a drug addict and, uh, you know, you're somebody who um, likes cocaine, 
This is the example I use with my patients. So I'll tell you the same example. Let's say you're somebody who likes cocaine and you take the cocaine snorted. I don't know how the cool kids do it these days, so I know nothing about that. But fine, let's imagine from the movies you snort it. But now I tell you that I have a way to get you off cocaine. So I tell Michelle that, Michelle, if you want to get off cocaine, every Saturday, I want you to inject heroin because you know what? You're going to be off cocaine. And you're going to look at me like I'm absolutely nuts. So when we talk about something that's 200 to as much as 26,000, depending on which one it is, what ends up happening is, is your dopamine release mechanisms. When you take sugar, the dopamine releases, you get excited. After a while, the dopamine dulls and sugar doesn't taste as sweet. But imagine if I give you something, let's take the example of stevia. Stevia is 300 times sweeter than sugar. You take stevia and now you wonder why your sweet tooth doesn't go away. Why you can't stick to a diet because of the fact that every time you do, a few weeks later, you're back to eating junk food is because you are causing that dopamine system to get absolutely crazy. Your nervous system is getting bombarded with this signal that's 300 times sweeter than sugar. And so now your cravings for those foods are going to be absolutely insane. But that's not where this whole thing stops. It gets much, much worse than that. So when you take artificial sweeteners, the first thing that tends to happen inside your gut is you get what's known as a leaky gut. So let's say that Michelle, and I'm going to exaggerate the number. So let's say Michelle is 100 pounds and I'm 300 pounds. Both Michelle and I eat a sandwich together. Same exact sandwich, whatever it is, right? It's like tofu and tomatoes and whatever. It's 100 calories. But what ends up happening is, is because I'm 300 pounds and Michelle is 100 pounds, I will have very different gut bacteria. So I may absorb 90 calories out of that 100 calorie sandwich. Michelle, on the other hand, may only absorb 60. So this is where I see couples all the time who come in my weight loss clinic and they say, Doc, you know, my wife or my husband eats whatever the heck he wants and doesn't gain any weight. But I actually walk by bad food and I gain two pounds just because I walked by it. It's because when you have the wrong bacteria, you get this leaky gut where you end up absorbing more calories and less calories go in stool. How do we know? In very well-designed studies where they had to bring these college kids into a lab and they actually took their stools, they burned it, and they looked at how much energy it produces. And they can see that folks who are actually skinnier, they have more energy that's sent through the stool versus what's being absorbed. That's why it matters so much. So the, the artificial sweeteners is damage to the gut microbiome. It's the multiple magnitudes higher in sweetness. Then they actually lead to insulin resistance. This is a fascinating phenomenon. So when I have patients who are looking to lose weight, for example, we tell them the more you end up taking artificial or non-nutritive sweeteners, because it includes the natural ones, what you're going to end up doing is create the insulin resistance, create more sugar that's going to float around your bloodstreams, and it's going to end up stimulating your appetite. So a classic example is that if you give somebody a diet Coke, they will actually finish more of their meal than if you just gave them a regular Coke or water. How crazy is that? The fact that these things will stimulate your appetite, even though they're zero calories. So in other words, in the world of respect, artificial sweeteners get absolutely zero respect from me. And I, I mean, I fully agree with you on that. And I'm glad you clarified non-nutritive, right? Like they're not providing calories, which is why they're this, like, they don't have the sugar or the calories, but, um, just because the stevia might be a, a natural non-nutritive sweetener. So it's not, you know, they say, oh, it's not artificial. Um, it's still being lumped into everything that you said there. And let me throw this question then at you, Dr. Hashmi, because I think this, this is what I always then get asked. It's like, okay, well then. And I, this is the distinction I think is like, we're not saying like you can never have a sweet or you can never have, like if you read something and you have a sweet and oh, they made it with stevia. Well, now you can't touch it. It's more like we talk about what are people doing just on a regular basis. Um, so don't, don't think that we're like, you can never ever touch it or you can never touch sugar. You can never touch an artificial sweetener, but it's artificial sweeteners aren't that including stevia and monk fruit and sugar alcohols. They aren't this just free for all food. What doesn't have an impact on your health just because it's not sugar. 
I, I think the the challenge that we run into is a couple of things. First is is we as a society, it's a really interesting phenomenon where we're looking for a way to have our cakes and eat it too. And so what I mean by that is is when I have a patient that's dying and I go to their bedside, you know, no patient ever tells me is is doc, you were too hard on me. They never say that to me. You know what they tell me is is I wish I had listened to you. And then I have to turn around and see their loved ones, whether it's their children or their spouses, who are just absolutely devastated because we're having that conversation. So when you're talking about your own life, the first thing you have to start off is, is you got to start by loving yourself. So before we start to get into this whole debate of I can't or I can or all the things in the middle, the first statement is, is if I want to love somebody, I have to fill my cup first. If you don't fill your cup, you can't fill anybody else's. It doesn't matter how PC you want to be about it or not. The challenge that we have with folks is, is that moderation is a very helpful thing. But the problem with folks is, is where does moderation end and your obligation to be a good husband, to be a good father, to be a good daughter, to be a good wife, to be a good brother, a sister, a mother, all of those things. It ends up being that we have to be around for the people we care. You know, there, there's this thing where um, I heard was when, when people die, what, what happens, right? And um, I heard this quote and they said, I don't know what happens, but all I know is that the people that love us miss us. And so I got into medicine because of the fact that I lost somebody that was very near and dear to me. I couldn't do anything. And when I talk to patients, I say, your why has to be more important than your what. If you don't figure out your why, all this stuff, pardon my French, but it's all BS. This whole thing about trying to negotiate with me, are you going to negotiate with the tax guy? I mean, people try, but it's very hard to negotiate with the tax guy. Well, with us, it's even harder because we have no say. If you're religious and you believe in God or if you don't believe in God, I, I can't answer that question. What I can say is as you're making choices, love yourself first. And if you start with a strong why and you say, I want to be there for the people that care about me, I don't want to see them cry. I don't want to see them hurt. It's much easier to make better decisions. So then the conversation no longer becomes, I can never have something or I can always have something. The conversation becomes is, I'm doing this to make myself better. And that's a much better way of starting this instead of turning these things into I'm depriving myself of, you know, not having X, Y, and Z. You can still have X, Y, and Z. But what you do as a habit is what you become. And when you break the habit once in a while, it does not change who you are. But your why must be greater than your what. I love that. I feel like we should and could have a whole episode just on on that alone. So maybe we will. <laughs> so there you guys have it on sugar and kidney disease and kidney health. And we will see you all next time. Bye, guys.